Hello, everyone. Welcome to the talk. Um, welcome to our talk of another talk of the Applied Games Track Games as a 21st century classroom. And um, before I go ahead and introduce our speakers, can you hear me? Can I just get a, a, a quick message to see if you can hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, before I go on to introduce our speakers, a few notifications on the right hand side of your panel, uh, you can see a, a section that says Q&A. So that's specifically for Q&A because in the past we've had people throwing questions in the discuss channel and then you lose those questions. So just one reminder, please post your questions on the Q&A uh, section. And uh, you can propose those questions at any point in the talk. So you don't have to wait for the end of the talk. Uh, as and when you, you have a question, just post it there. And uh, at the end of the talk, we'll have around 10 to 15 minutes of question and answer time. So that's going to be an interesting space that we're going to interact. Uh, the discuss space is for you to talk uh, share observations, uh, appreciate anything that you liked in the talk. So feel free to interact there. Um, another quick, quick notification is about the handout. So in the handout section, you will see a um, feedback form, which I will post very soon. So that particular form is for the session, and we would love to hear your feedback on it. It's a really quick form, so it would really help if you can fill that out. Um, and yeah, that's that's it for all the notifications. Uh, it's time to introduce our speakers. So our speakers for today, um, we have Danny, uh, who's our uh, first speaker, and he is working with UNESCO and GIP as a consultant right now. Uh, Danny has been working on the issue of education and preventing and countering violent extremism for more than seven years now, and most recently with the UNDP in Indonesia. Uh, he's also working on a project called Digital Games for Peace, uh, he graduated from the UN mandated University for Peace with a degree in international peace studies. And his topics of interest include interreligious, intercultural dialogue, peace education, youth and sustainable development. And he also he enjoys encounters and engagement with people from different worldviews, cultures, and walks of life. Um, so Danny, could you come on stage, please? Uh, you can just click on the like button and, and come on stage so that we can see you. And then I will go ahead and introduce our second speaker for the day. OK, so we have Vignesh. This is Vignesh. I just got in. So I, OK, uh, Danny, can you also come on stage, please? So Vignesh, what happened is I just introduced Danny. <laughs> so yeah, we have Danny here. And our second speaker for, this, for, uh, for the talk is uh, Vignesh. Vignesh Mukun, he is a designer with the Games for Learning, uh, UNESCO MGIP. Vignesh is a designer who's passionate about games and believes in the power of play as a means to acquire new knowledge. Uh, he is currently engaged with the Games for Learning team at UNESCO MGIP again, and where he applies his multidisciplinary background to design innovative pedagogical solutions that leverage the best of technology to help cultivate critical thinking and social emotional skills in learners. Um, I have been part of some of these talks and they're really impactful. Um, social emotional learning is something that's very close to my heart. So really looking forward to this talk and I will hand over the session to Vignesh and Dani. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, hello folks and uh, those who have seen us last year, hello again. Um, I'm very glad to be back again at IGDC and uh, update you on what we've, we've been up to since the last uh, time we spoke. Um, well, now that Sarah has already introduced us, uh, I'm going to skip this slide. You know, we work in um, we work at UNESCO MGIP, which is a the first category one research institute in all of Asia Pacific. And um, MGIP, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development, was established uh, with a mandate to find solutions, find a way to achieve uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 4.7. Now, SDG 4.7 is 
quite a mouthful, but in brief, it's, it's education for sustainable development and global citizenship. So towards this, we have several um, different initiatives, primarily focused around digital pedagogy and social emotional learning. So we have uh, programs that target K to 12 learning. Um, we have other programs that focus on youth between 18 to 35 years of age. And we have a separate policy department that um, that works uh, works with and advises government to sort of bring learnings from our research uh, into practice. So um, we titled our talk um, games as the 21st century classroom. Now, as an institute focused um, primarily on on digital pedagogy and social emotional learning, it's important that we first have a fully formed idea about what we envision the 21st century classroom to be and how it's different from uh, the classroom of the past century. So um, the classroom um, today, it it's where learning happens. So um, it, it's not confined to the walls of a specific area. It's not within a school. It could be uh, on your phone. It could be um, on the metro, um, in front of the computer anywhere that you can access um, knowledge and gain skills is uh, is a classroom now also uh, this classroom does not focus specifically on literacy and numeracy alone it focuses on skills and competencies that um, are necessary for human flourishing now we can't just focus on um, like in the 20th century focusing on math and science that would uh, ensure you have a good job or you make a good factory worker. The focus now is on more uh, social emotional learning. Um, and that has that needs to happen within the space of this classroom. Uh, and the third thing is, um, it imparts knowledge, uh, which has a, a real world context. And it imparts knowledge in a way that's uh, very similar to how humans naturally acquire and apply knowledge. So, um, and video games do all of these. Um, so they are the 21st century classroom. Thank you very much. <laughs> I kid. Um, I'll just give you a quick recap of what we spoke about last year. Um, so that we can build upon that. Uh, this is how the next 30 or so minutes will go. Um, I will speak for about 15 minutes or so on, um, some of our studies that we've done, uh, this year. And uh, Danny will then speak on games in informal learning. So um, last year, we spoke a bit about emo social emotional learning. Um, at the Institute, we have our own framework for this. It's called the EMC Square Framework. Um, it stands for empathy, mindfulness, compassion, and critical inquiry. Um, this is what we, these are the skills, the core fundamental SEL skills that we think other um, second order social emotional skills can be built upon. So each of the digital courses that we create or any initiative that we have, we have these four uh, core competencies in mind when we design learning experiences around uh, around something. So um, we spoke about social emotional learning and we spoke about games and learning. Uh, under games and learning, uh, the thing that I'd like to highlight again is that um, the characteristics of the ideal gamer and the ideal learner are uh, pretty much alike. What an educator desires in their um, in the ideal student is very much what the game designer designs uh, for. So uh, they're all they both hooked to problem solving. Uh, they're motivated by displays of mastery, and failure is always a chance to find out what doesn't work. So. Um, that's games and how games and learning are similar. And then we also showcase two uh, of the many game-based courses that we have created. Uh, a game-based course is basically a supplementary material. Um, so a bunch of um, specifically designed activities and engagement um, around the narrative of a video game. So in a conventional course, if you have, say, um, a chapter or a textbook that the teacher might read along with the students. And then the teacher might have homework or classwork and other group discussions built uh, around the content of the textbook. In a game-based course, uh, the learner is actually 
asked to play a video game. And then the complementary activities are uh, online. And these are also specifically designed around the experiences of the player in such a video game. Um, what this does is that um, because of the immersive nature and the first person sort of experience uh, where you embody another individual rather than just reading about them, it makes for extremely uh, impactful experiences that that connect with the player. So especially for things like social emotional learning, empathy and compassion, um, even for knowledge competencies, what happens is that the learner is so invested in a video game um, that if you have the right sort of activities that then uh, remove the player from the game world and reinforce those learnings outside of the game world and tie it to real world uh, context, uh, it makes that learning that much more solid. So um, we've designed several game-based courses. Um, I will tell you about one uh, specific research study around one game-based course. Um, so like I said, I'll speak about the research study and then I'll hand it over to Danny to speak about games and informal learning. So we claim that uh, game-based courses are effective at building social emotional competencies and knowledge competencies. Uh, so obviously the core question that we had was, uh, is it true? So um, we first had to identify uh, the, the perfect game to conduct such um, a study on. So we picked uh, Bury Me My Love. Um, for those of you on, who haven't heard of this game, it's, um, it's a very simple, easy, Access, it's very accessible, the game itself, the way it plays. It's the story of uh, Noor, a Syrian refugee, uh, who's trying to escape uh, war-torn Syria and rebuild a life in Europe. Um, the most interesting part about the game is that you don't play as Noor. You play as her uh, husband, Majid, who, due to certain situational, certain circumstances, um, he had to stay back in Syria. So through the course of her journey, Noor um, contacts and updates Majid on the various things that she's experiencing. And you are presented with uh, choices on how to respond. So it's ba it basically plays on a, um, on a fake chat, um, a messaging app interface. And the entire story was, uh, it was designed and developed by a small studio in France called The Pixel Hunt. And they spoke with a lot of people uh, refugees who had made it to Germany um, in 2015-16. So uh, it's it's based in real life experiences and it has a branching narrative. So each of the options, each of the choices that you take, they could be inconsequential or have drastic consequences. Um, so we thought this was a perfect game to design a course to teach concepts of um, migration, identity, um, the refugee crisis, while also building competencies of empathy, mindfulness, compassion, and critical inquiry by um, linking the experience of the player within the game to real life uh, refugees who have struggled and who've, who've made uh, the journey from uh, Syria to different parts of Europe. We also focus a little bit on the self and how such a refugee crisis uh, impacts the individual, their dreams and aspirations. So with this in mind, um, we then designed the study. So it was a 16 week um, intervention where we had uh, 300 students across um, 10 schools, five in UAE and five in India. And we designed it in such a way that we could, um, we wanted to compare the differences in um, the, the participant pre-intervention and post-intervention. So we had to design uh, an assessment test, which consisted of three core domains. Um, there was a knowledge domain, which um, measured a participant's knowledge and attitude towards migration and refugees. Um, there was the, the empathy domain, which measured uh, the participant's cognitive and affective empathy. And uh, there was the compassion domain, which had three subscales again, uh, self-compassion, uh, compassion from others and compassion to others. So um, the empathy and compassion scales are standardized uh, peer reviewed scales that are used uh, in self-report uh, psychological assessment studies. 
the knowledge scale was something that uh, we built upon. So it was OECDs. Uh, there's the PISA scale. We built upon that with uh, some of our in-house knowledge on global citizenship and other courses that we've done in the past. Um, so the participants took the pre-assessment test. Then they played the game, bearing in my love. Each one made uh, several different choices and they all branched out uh, in various ways. Some played the game more than once. Uh, they were given about two weeks to complete the game. Um, then they took the three module course. So the course had, um, it was designed in a way that no matter what options or choices you pick, we still, uh, we needed to have a common sort of a base experience that everyone might have had. So uh, once they took the course, they were asked to take the post assessment test again. And um, we had three hypotheses basically uh, at the very beginning. So uh, the first was we predicted that uh, there would be an increase in knowledge and social emotional uh, scores of the participants post the intervention. Uh, we also predicted that um, females would score higher than males. Uh, this was this is generally due to not just um, perceived social conditioning, but also uh, we found several studies that um, that state that um, biologically as well in the rudimentary signs of empathy are uh, uh, are demonstrated by um, female. Uh, infants than male so that was another hypothesis we had and we also expected to find a positive correlation between empathy and compassion uh so how do we do um we found uh, that the knowledge and attitudes which is basically there were three sub skills there was the awareness of migration and refugees and the respect uh, for people from other cultures both of which showed a statistically significant increase um Another scale, interest in learning about other cultures did not show a uniform increase across both countries and both genders. Uh, this specifically, um, this was uniform uh, across uh, our entire variable set. And um, interestingly, we also found that the score increased more in India than in UAE. Uh, we believe it might be because uh, UAE is, is a lot more cosmopolitan and a lot more migrants live there. So perhaps they are more exposed to such issues. Um, and respect for people from other cultures is another scale that we predicted an increase in primarily because you are, um, you play as someone, um, you're, you're basically embodying another person while playing this game over the course of seven days. And, um, you actually create this sort of close bond with, uh, Noor when you play as Majad and this fictional character becomes someone, you know, and this sort of uh, first person experience did make a difference. Um, the second hypothesis basically about, uh, females, uh, showing an increase, um, change in, uh, SEL, especially, uh, in empathy and compassion. Unfortunately, we did not see the change in empathy and, uh, we've, uh, since then gone back and revised the course a bit. However, we saw that compassion from others, uh, we saw that, uh, females showed, um, statistically significant changes, whereas males did not. Um, we have a few uh, reasons to explain this. Uh, we think it could be uh, one unproven uh, reason could be because um, Noor is a female and having a first person, having the protagonist be of your gender might make it uh, such that you empathize and connect more with them. Uh, and it's also been shown that, uh, like I said earlier, Several peer-reviewed studies have shown that um, women in general are more empathetic. And since empathy is uh, uh, is what leads to compassion, we believe uh, this, along with the fact that um, women, the social structure of um, female friendships, uh, these groups are more tightly knit than male friendships. Uh, they might be more open to receiving help and compassion. Um, our third prediction, which was basically a positive correlation between empathy and compassion, also uh, was reflected in our findings. So um, if you notice the underlines, the colors, cognitive empathy and compassion to others uh, was positively correlated. So it's a little circle that you see here um, that denotes there is some correlation. Uh, we can't really say which way it goes, but we think um, 
cognitive empathy is basically the objective understanding and the ability to um, feel uh, not feel but understand uh, empathy as a concept or perceive it so uh, we think a person who has the ability or the knowledge cognitive understanding of empathy might then be pushed to make um, take altruistic actions uh, that are that help another uh, whereas self compassion and compassion to others also is correlated and um, one reason could be because uh, individuals who are self compassionate are basically uh, in a much better position to not let negative thoughts um, sway them uh, especially when they are in distress and that might then help them be of more help to others and uh, compassion to others and compassion from others was also correlated uh, which basically says that uh, the ability to to um, receive care also predicts the ability to give care so um, this is a very positive study as far as we know this is the first large scale um, study based on a uh, on a digital game and a game based course um there are several studies that just have the design of a game but we uh, have the supplementary material that um highlights the learning outcomes that uh, a game that might not be designed specifically for learning um can also take so um we we plan to follow this up and to tie it back to the 21st century classroom uh yovi saw that um the the a problem such as um the refugee crisis which is global and socially relevant it makes it very accessible it's a theme that cannot be taught in your traditional classroom it made the entire experience more engaging for the individual um and it was effective at building social emotional competencies um like you saw a uh, compassion and it can be leveraged to impart contextualized knowledge which through the course um, even though you're experiencing only the story of noor by having uh, learning experiences that then uh, extrapolate that um, that experience from the game world to real world uh, facts and experiences of other individuals um, it's a very innovative and uh, an effective way to actually um, teach um, in this century so uh that's about the research study i'm going to hand it over to danny to speak about games and informal learning yeah uh thank you uh, fitness um so uh i saw some questions so uh, i believe that fitness um is going to address that uh, later on uh, meanwhile i will continue the presentations uh, especially in terms of uh, informal learning Uh, still under the framework of a game as the 21st century classroom. Um, next week, but I would like to um, give you a kind of a, a background information that is going to be a little bit specific uh, because um, the project that we are doing, uh, uh, specifically about uh, SDG 4.7. Uh, in particular in the area of uh, peace building and um, uh, preventing violent extremism. And this is the a kind of uh, a brainstorming um, picture that uh, we would like to present. And education is still at the core, but of course uh, we understand there are you know, two different uh, polarized um, contexts, uh, violent extremism and preventing violent extremism. I'm not going to provide you a kind of a definition, but uh, I'll give you, you know, uh, some elements that uh, entail with uh, its entity. So violent extremism, for example, uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, connect with, uh, let's say, hate speech, misinformation, disinformation, direct violence, if we use the theory of Johan Galtung, for example, and then radicalization. Um, of course, uh, actually, uh, there are two important uh, keys here. Uh, the first one is inequality, and then another one is uh, uh, grievance. And then preventing violent extremism, uh, we do have like a counter radicalization, non-violence, conflict sensitivity, and uh, fact checking. And The impact is clear, though. So uh, basically, uh, according to the UN plan of actions, uh, 
violent extremism uh, clearly undermine peace and security, human rights, and sustainable development. And no country or region is immune uh, from it, it, its impact. And next fig. And uh, interestingly, um, if we are uh, trying to connect with uh, digital games, um, there are several games that I would like to mention here. Uh, the first one is uh, what is called as ethnic cleansing. So the uh, top um, corner on the left, uh, it is um, a game, a first person shooter video game um, for Microsoft uh, Windows computer uh, created by American white supremacists and head organization called National Alliance. And it was published in 2002. Um, and we can see that uh, they use kind of, uh, you know, a neo-Nazi uh, narrative, uh, including uh, playing as um, um, as a new, neo-Nazi skinhead and or a clansman. And uh, the player will be uh, assigned to kill uh, African, Mexican, and Jewish. Uh, including uh, the final one would be uh, killing the uh, Israel uh, Prime Minister at the time, uh, Ariel Saron. And then uh, another one uh, on the right corner uh, is a little bit uh, a cover. It is Holocaust ty Tycoon. Uh, it is basically a kind of uh, a video game that uh, asks the player to manage uh, uh, a camp. Uh, which is the camp of uh, during the uh, Second uh, World War uh, for the Jewish uh, um, um, yeah, to, uh, you know, um, and to protect the camp from the uh, invasions of the uh, allied forces. And then the last one, uh, the big picture is the, uh, if you are uh, uh, following the issue of uh, terrorism, uh, the brand uh, Tarrant, uh, which is uh, known as the shooter of uh, Christchurch in 2019. Uh, so uh, the video uh, game player can play a uh, game uh, in this game. Um, it is taken from um, the uh, the screen. Actually, is taken from the um, coverage from the Economist, uh, Far Right Online, and the rise of extremist uh, group gamers. Um, this, these are the example of uh, video games uh, used by a certain group to promote uh, extremist uh, narrative. And in fact, uh, next thing, if we uh, talk about uh, research, there is a recent research from the Radicalization Awareness Network, um, clearly stating that um, video game uh, has been uh, used effectively by um, the violent extremist group. They mirror a uh, let's play a uh, video popular in the gaming community as well as uh, using like a first person shooter games. And uh, the commentary as well, uh, true gamified language that are used by a uh, violent extremist group. And uh, the DAIS or IS group also uh, use this kind of uh, elements. Uh, for example, uh, Call of Duty uh, to promote or to recruit um, new uh, violent extremists. And then uh, the next week, so that's why uh, we would like uh, through this project that uh, I am doing with uh, Fitness uh, for UNESCO MGIP, trying to uh, change this kind of uh, landscape uh, from the left one, uh, violent extremists uh, using digital games uh, to catalyze uh, the issue of uh, violent extremism. Uh, especially influence a uh, youth uh, to the right one. So uh, my job is uh, to transform uh, from the left one uh, to the uh, right one. Of course, uh, video game itself, you know, uh, many uh, have stereotyped uh, video games as a bad influence in terms of violence um, uh, a narrative, although uh, there are also many uh, counter uh, research, uh, you know, um, basically proving that uh, this is not true. Um, but uh, we would like to uh, create a kind of video games that can catalyze solutions in this case uh, to prevent uh, violent extremism uh, through social emotional learning and as well as uh, intercultural uh, dialogue. 
and the main uh, target still same uh, they are uh, young people next click and uh, so this this is the uh, whole uh, thing that uh, we do um, the first one is the capacity building uh, we train uh, young people uh, in terms of um, social emotional learning intercultural dialogue preventing violent extremism as well as a uh, game design so we expect that uh, they can create a kind of a game based solutions uh, for a uh, pve uh, and we expect that it can be used especially in the informal setting and uh, we get support from uh, a lot of stakeholders including uh, uh, mentors uh, game uh, designers like uh, uh, Paul Darfasi uh, and then uh, Matthew Farber, Chris Crowell, etc. Uh, we also work with uh, some uh, organizations like uh, Game Fortunes, and we got uh, support from uh, two uh, well-known game uh, studios, Anapurna and Eleven uh, Bit. Um, the project is still ongoing, and hopefully by um, mid-February we can, you know, uh, show you a kind of. Uh, prototype or a kind of a concept of uh, digital games uh, for preventing violent extremism that are created by uh, young people from uh, six different countries, uh, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and uh, Myanmar. And um, next, Vic. Uh, I think that's all. Um, and of course, uh, please do uh, explore uh, the... Uh, games for learning uh, self-paced course that uh, we uh, produce um, and then uh, you can check um, on the uh, link that uh, we already uh, provide. Uh, you can also explore uh, many other uh, courses including uh, publications and projects at the uh, UNESCO uh, MGIP uh, website. Uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity. I will uh, open for uh, further discussions. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Vignesh. Um, so yeah, we are bang on time. So we have 15 minutes Q&A. So please feel free to make the most of this time. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, so I will start with the first one. Uh, this is a question asked by Joel. What was the time gap between end of course and post assessment? So I think this was when Vignesh, when you were presenting the data, that, that's when this question was asked. So um, we had... Um... We gave them a time frame. So initially, we gave them two weeks to do the pre-assessment, uh, 10 weeks then to play the game. And the post-assessment were the last two weeks. So of the 16-week intervention, some schools, because of how the exams, uh, like exams in UAE uh, and exams in India were at different times. So we gave the teachers the liberty to either have the, um, the course taken after the exams or uh, do it before. So the maximum time was about two weeks between the end of the course and post assessment ideally um i'm sorry if, if there's any background noise someone's bursting firecrackers um but ideally uh, these post assessments should be done regularly to see the long-term impact of such an intervention however we only had the resources to do it once um so yeah i hope that answers your question thank you very much uh, okay, the next question is asked, uh, it, it says, what tool do you use to measure competencies like empathy, compassion, and respect? This is, enough, this is a question sneaked in by me. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, there are certain limitations when it comes to such studies. One of it is the fact that we have to use um, self-reports. So these are uh, peer-reviewed um, scales. So there's the basic empathy scale. Uh, that measures cognitive empathy and affective empathy uh, with 20 questions. So they have uh, a scoring mechanism and based on how the student responds or the participants, it's not just for adolescents. Um, you can then uh, figure out, uh, you can then have a score for each of these subscales. So um, the respect, so compassion has a similar scale. Uh, it's called the compassionate engagement and action scale. That is peer reviewed as well. Um, and for the respect, uh, we have certain questions that um, there are a bunch of yes or no questions. And most of the other questions, uh, like in empathy and compassion scales, are Likert scale questions. So the participant has to sc uh, score from unlikely, highly unlikely, or uh, 
strongly disagree to agree. So it's a five point scale. And we ask them a bunch of questions that sort of measure uh, various attitudes and uh, stuff like respect and interest. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Xenia, Xenia Zylo. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, this is fantastic. Thanks for the talk. What about the legal issues around using a game not developed by yourself for your course? Example, did you collaborate somehow with the creators of Bury Me, My Love? And who developed the course? Yes, uh, on point here, uh, because this is this was a tricky thing for us to at the beginning. Uh, we contact uh, the developers. The first thing when we decide to make a course, we do send an email. And uh, fortunately, what happens is most of the uh, game de developers and designers, they haven't really designed for education. So the moment uh, they realize that it's possible to use their game for education, um, they're extremely happy to collaborate and support us, especially with Bury My Love. They've been uh, extremely supportive for the past three years now. And um, we, we've now the results that I showed you are from a publication that has been approved uh, for to be published in a journal. And uh, we keep them in the loop and we only develop the course. So the creators don't have any input on the course content itself, but uh, they're free to review. They're free to give us uh, feedback or suggestions. But um that's about the sort of um contact and collaboration we have with the creators of games thank you um the next question by panchumi how do you place design systems in place to check or track emotional quotients so i think this is a question for all the game designers because the re uh, personally like i said self reports um are a crutch i mean there's it's a limitation of such a study so the ideal way would be if we could embed uh, stealth assessments within the game so all of these progression systems that you have if if there were a way uh, to sort of measure uh, emotional quotients of the players uh, within the game we wouldn't need uh, a game based course we wouldn't need to have assessments outside of the game so um, if only we'd spent more time uh, trying to develop systems, uh, game systems, mechanics uh, to to sort of mimic real world social relationships, it would have been easier. But we spend way too much time on bullets and bullet physics and accurate recoil stuff. So unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the necessary game design experience to answer that question for you. Okay, thank you again. Um, okay, so recently, this is a question asked by Ronit Roy. Recently in the US, FDA approved the use of gaming as a form of behavioral therapy for ADHD afflicted people. Is there any special process you're working on as an additional hand for learning difficulties and other neuroatypical students? Um, unfortunately, uh, we aren't working on anything um, specifically for neuroatypical uh, individuals. Um, but I did read about this and there's a the journal Games for Health has a lot, a lot of studies, and it speaks about a lot other, a lot of other initiatives that do things like these. Danny, do you know about anything else? Can't hear you. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't have any specific um, information about this, but uh, I heard like a lot of. Um, you know, those who work uh, in terms of behavioral therapy or including like uh, uh, ADHD, um, they also use game for uh, uh, to uh, help uh, the uh, patients in terms of the recovery, etc. Um, yeah, uh, but I cannot remember uh, uh, specifically in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, what kind of game, etc. But uh, I I do believe that uh, we can easily uh, find if we uh, you know Google uh, a lot of uh, uh, research about this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a great question, though. Um, the the next one. Okay. So, how does one change the mindset when the violence in games is very common and also very subconscious and subtle at times? Like, I think this relates to the slide that Dani was talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah. Your violence and extremism. Um, yeah, uh, we discussed a lot. I mean, like, um, first of all, I think the idea that uh, games uh, 
encourage or uh, promote uh, violence, including uh, how it can influence somebody' uh, behavior or attitude uh, toward uh, more pro violence because of games. It is still uh, debatable. Uh, actually, a lot of uh, research say, uh, you know, um, basically it's not proven, um, at least uh, uh, scientifically. Uh, although, like uh, longitudinal research, uh, research uh, with a certain games, uh, let's say um, uh, one very famous game, uh, GTA, I think, um, they uh, do a kind of a longitudinal research. Uh, and then uh, for several years, they um, say, like, uh, actually, Uh, playing for certain hours or you know uh, for a certain period uh, do not provide a kind of uh, um, encouragement to uh, violence uh, so that's why uh, it's pretty uh, debatable uh, second like uh, the some examples that I show I show you actually uh, those are pretty uh, clear in terms of uh, you know promoting uh, uh, violence based on the historical fact like a uh, holocaust and then, Uh, using uh, Brent Terran, uh, who are the shooter of, uh, uh, who is the shooter of the uh, uh, Christian um, uh, terrorist attack, um, as uh, one of the characters. Those kind of uh, uh, messages that actually we need to um, suppress, or we need to uh, really uh, uh, careful in terms of filtering to uh, young uh, people. And uh, third, uh, actually, there are a lot of games that uh, promote, you know, otherwise. Uh, for example, uh, the one that uh, Fitness introduced to me, uh, Attentat uh, 1942, I think. It's pretty interesting game, uh, basically from the um, Holocaust um, survivor, um, how, you know, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, from uh, escape from uh, this kind of uh, tra uh, tragedy and uh, make us, you know, more... Uh, empath empathize uh, with the situations. I think uh, there are a lot of other games as well that promote, uh, you know, uh, um, empathy, kindness, etc. For example, like a Bury Me, uh, My Love, uh, and those kind of games that uh, should be uh, more, uh, you know, uh, receiving uh, spotlight as well as to be promoted in the uh, educational context. Fitness more probably you can add more. Okay, uh, this is uh, probably the last question. So, uh, by Anand, how receptive do you find children are to the notion of SEL through games when they are explicitly aware that they are playing games for learning? I think the way to look at this is that um, introducing a game into the classroom is uh, is very exciting for a, for a 12, 13-year-old uh, rather than having... Um, having studies being done in their playtime. So when we did the study with, uh, with the 300 students, we received a lot of testimonials from uh, kids who played the game multiple times. And they were, we also had the opportunity to sneak into a few of these group discussion sessions that teachers had with their students. And the students weren't aware we were there. So uh, them discussing, um, so there was, there was so much, uh, there was a vibrant discussion on this because of the fact that they thought Uh, during learning time, they were playing games. And while the learning was just a little bit more, uh, you know, subtle. Uh, so I think it's it's far more, um, it's it, it's a far more novel and effective approach than we actually, um, we would um, predict or imagine. Thank you. Um I think the, the just building on that, uh, another quick thought is that I think the comparison is like if a kid can play Subway Surfer uh, on their own um, what, and versus, you know, telling them, okay, this is a game uh, where explicitly there is some sort of learning that is, uh, and they recognize that. Um, I think that's where the, um, you know, how do they react to those two if you had to compare or, you know, build on that. Uh, Sorry, I'll just also quickly read this, the one, the last question by Ronit. Building on what Anand asked, because it's just connected to that, so you can think of it. Uh, is there any special strategy employed to hook in the part of a class that are reluctant to participate in activities? I think it's more of a review on the quality of activities if it's difficult for uh, to keep your learners engaged in, in them. Uh, 
most in in our experience what what we do is these courses even though they are um they're for any 13 year old to come online and take uh it's usually the educators who come attend one of our workshops get interested in games uh for learning um so they are already uh, we we haven't tried to convince a teacher who's not familiar with games themselves so if there's an educator who's already on this side of the fence where they want to use games for learning um they are quite effective we don't have our own special strategy but they seem to have ways to then uh bring together their class and as a cohort go through the entire game so they play the game and then they have discussions so there's there's some sort of motivation to keep up with the group and engage in all those uh discussions and peer learning as it happens uh but no we don't have any special strategy okay thank you vignesh yeah i think that's an important point though like sometimes yeah we could reach out to teachers and parents and i think getting them involved in in the process just facilitates So, so completely agree to that that's that's a well made point uh we run out of time <laughs> so i'm sorry if i missed on any questions but thank you so much thank you vignesh thank you danny for spending this time and uh, the q and a session is always a, a path that i look forward to because i i'm really interested in knowing what the audience wants to ask what's going on in your head so thank you so much for asking these questions uh it was a great interaction um uh, one quick reminder i uh, if you go to the handout section there is a feedback form there please please do spend some time filling it in it's a very short quick form uh, it will really help us um you know design our tracks better so that's that's just one last quick notification the next next talk that's happening is um on the applied games is what i what disney taught me about play and learning by kathleen so please feel free to hop on to that it's in another 15 minutes um and yeah thank you again once again vignesh and dani it was a it was a really impactful talk yeah. and we'll see you soon yeah thank you <laughs> thank you very much thanks bye everyone